We you grab your Bibles, you will turn, turn to just John chapter 6 right now and then um, and we'll pray and uh, set the scene. So John chapter 6, uh, that'll do for the moment, in verse 35. But before you look into that, let's pray and just ask the Holy Spirit to guide us, be with us and encourage us this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to come together collectively to worship you. We thank you, for Lord Jesus, for your love for us, for what you have done on the cross and what we're about to share in later on with communion. Lord, we give you thanks. Lord, for your word that we're about to share with this morning, may it impress upon our heart, Lord, as we review and look at this living water, salvation and the Spirit, Lord. I pray that you impact on our hearts and lives today. For those of us who know you as Lord and Saviour, Lord, I pray that we be impacted. And for those of us who don't know you, Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak to their hearts today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, last week, um, uh, Chris, as usual, done a, a really amazing job of introducing us to the bread, the bread of life. And we certainly looked at partly the, the Old Testament and we read a little bit in the New Testament about this bread of life. And so this week, um, we're also looking at the living water. So it's pretty much standard within God's word. We see in the Old Testament and partly in the New Testament, we see parallels between nourishment for our bodies through bread and water, um, but also nourishment in the context of nourishment for our souls. Let's look at uh, verse 35 of John chapter 6. It's a bit of an introduction and to tie last week and this week together. John 6 verse 35 says, And Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never be thirsty. Right from the beginning of this, last week and this week, we want to reiterate that God is an ever-longing source of life. Our Lord Jesus is a fountain of life eternal. And this verse, verse 35 of chapter 6, sort of draws those two together. You know, we need bread, um, and it obviously completes our hunger. We need water because it completes our thirst. But Jesus isn't talking about our human bodies. He's talking about our souls. And my question to you today is, how does your soul feel? Does your soul feel well fed? Does your soul feel thirsty and hungry? Let's just remember, keep this verse in mind, that Jesus will provide all our spiritual needs, our spiritual hunger and our spiritual thirst will be through him. So we read this account about manna this bread-like substance that was provided by God for his people when they were in need and they needed him to provide food. They were hungry. They were in the desert. This brought us to recognise that God is a provider. And what I really liked was two points that Chris brought out, and one in particular that really resonated with me is that God provided enough for each day. Yeah. God provides enough for each day. In our, in our secular world, um, and even in our own humanity, we love to store up things, do we not? Just in case. You know, if we, if we need $10 put away, well, let's put away 20 if we can because, you know, it will be safer. I feel more secure. I feel if I have control. But God provided enough for each day. You know, he wanted the people of Israel to be reliant upon him. He gave them some guidelines for how much to even use and yet they fell short of remembering to stick to those guidelines. As Chris mentioned, it's not much different to what you and I are. Even though God may tell us and provide us just what we need, we always feel that we need to maybe store up more. We need to maybe just use our own resources and our, 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 own, our own construction to maybe make things a bit more secure for our lives. But it was reminded to us last week that God provides for you and for me, enough for each day. Second point that I got out of it is God desired them and desires me today to trust in him for the next day. Yeah. So not only did God provide enough for each day for the provision of God's people, and he does for us, 
is that God desired them to trust him for the next. You know, this is this bit about storing up, uh, storing up things for ourselves. Do we recognise that God not only provides enough for the situation because he is faithful, but he'll be faithful tomorrow as well. Yeah. Part of the chorus of that song that we just sang and what really impacted on me where I got up and shared was the fact that you know, sometimes we forget about God's faithfulness. Just like the people of Israel, God was faithful daily and yet the people of Israel still felt the need to maybe store up a little bit more. Jesus is the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Let's talk about the thirsty part today. Today's message I want to bring into focus a bit more now, the term living water. The Old Testament accounts for this term are found within several passages. I'm not going to look at them today. But yeah, there's always this parallel between thirst in what we're used to in our own bodies and what we need and also to the, our thirst for our souls, or thirsting after God, or a God. Normally in, in uh, everyday life I see people who don't know Jesus thirsting after something. They thirst after success, they you know, thirst after relationships being correct and right, they thirst after education, they thirst after property, they, all these things that they feel that makes their life secure and correct they thirst after. But we need to thirst after God. And we're going to read a bit more about this in a minute. So there's some several, several texts, if you like to look at them in your own time. There's Psalm 36, Psalm 42, I think that's as the deer pants for the water, Isaiah 55, Jeremiah 2, and verse 13, and chapter 17 and 13 in Jeremiah as well. All of these accounts where it uses the words living water, talks about ultimately God being symbolised as a spring of living water. Now what's what's a spring? Something that we're not so common with today because in our own lives, our own household, we want water, we just go and turn on the tap, do we not? And then when we've had enough, we turn it off and when we want some more, we turn it on until someone says, hey, turn that tap off. Okay, sorry, turn the tap off. So water for us today is probably, um, it's not as it's not as impacting as it was to people in these times, in biblical times. Water was a key part of sustenance in their life, so was bread. So water was key. So when God is symbolised as this, if you like, spring of living water, a spring is so much better than a well or a container or a cistern because a spring is forever flowing, forever bubbling over. It's replenished regularly. Not like a well. A well relies on rain, water coming down into the well, it filling up, and yes, it might be a really deep well and might hold a lot of water and serve a lot of people, but if it doesn't continue to rain, it's going to run dry. God has spoken about in the Old Testament as this spring of life or living water. It's replenishing for those who want to be satisfied. Living water can be further understood in various ways, but the clearest way or symbol about living water for me in this New Testament passage that we're going to look at in in John 4 is it's living water is about salvation. It's about the true knowledge of God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. God provides us with everything we need and this living water, this Jesus, continues to always give in our lives. Let's um, let's turn to John chapter 4 and we're going to look at... um, a passage headed up the, uh, the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. It's so John chapter 4, and I'm going to start looking at verse, verse 7. I'm not going to talk about the whole passage. just want to pick out things where Jesus encounters this woman at the well, and uh, there's a lot of conversation about living water and uh, the need for living water and this living water being eternal and ongoing. So um, just turn with me to John sorry, chapter 4, verse 7, and we're going to read verse 7 to 9. But just to probably set the context of this a little bit, so Jesus talks to a woman. In, in today's, today's society, we think, yeah, big deal, a man you know, runs into a lady somewhere and has a conversation and maybe has a gospel conversation. But in this time... The Israelites 
and the Samaritans, they didn't connect at all. Some 700 years earlier before Christ, there was this, the northern division and, and I suppose the southernmost division of Israel, the Syrians had attacked uh, the northern division. They took over areas in Israel. No doubt over hundreds of years there was mixing and inbreeding and those that were pure, a pure Jew would see a Samaritan as a half-breed. They would see them as impure. So for Jesus to even walk into Samaria was a huge thing. It's a huge thing, let alone talk to a woman, let alone be a rabbi and talk to a woman and be a Jew. So really want to recognise here, I suppose, the gravity of this conversation that Jesus starts. Let's start with verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food, so Jesus asked for a drink. The Samaritan wouldn't said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you even ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. A, a, key, a key part of this passage that I want to look at is obviously I want to reflect on that Jesus is this living water, salvation. And this passage is beautiful, which we're going to have a look at a bit further, no doubt. And it's, a, it's purely gospel. There's this beautiful gospel conversation of Jesus reaching out to this woman and wanting her to recognise who he is. But how does he start? He starts with a conversation. Can I ask you, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit, what sort of boundaries do you step out around to speak to someone who doesn't know Jesus? You know, Jesus starts this conversation and he's willing to cross huge boundaries so this woman gets to know who he is, is ultimately saved. In our lives today, you know, what do we do? We, do we just play church and we enjoy time of fellowship and worship in song? We go to all the ministries that are associated, but when it comes to the gospel, what boundaries do we step outside of to ensure the gospel is heard by non-believers? Now, reality is there's people in our lives who we just don't feel comfortable with. You know, maybe a, an Israelite to a Samaritan just don't feel comfortable with that. You know, I've been brought up to stay away from those people. They're a bit unclean. But in your life today, what boundaries will you be prepared to walk through so that others may know about Jesus? Jesus, this living water, Let's unpack this a bit further. Let's move down to verse, verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, that's him, that's Jesus, and who, is, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would, ask, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. This is this eternal living water. Verse 11. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw from the well with, and it is deep. Where can you get this water? Jesus desires for her to know who he really is. He called for her to actually, do you recognise who I am? Do you recognise that I am the Messiah? If you come to me, I will give you living water that's eternal. Unfortunately, at this point in time in the story or in the account, this lady has just misinterpreted what Jesus was saying. She's thinking practically, oh, this guy's going to offer me living water, but hang on, you haven't got a bucket. You haven't got a bucket of the rope, and I'm the only one who's brought the equipment. So how are you going to give me living water? Let's read a bit further, verse 13 and 14. And here Jesus implies whatever is good and is earthly that the world may offer, it does not last. So let's look at verse 13. He starts to unpack a little bit more. Jesus answered, whoever drinks this water will be thirsty again. So in other words, I can give you this water. If I had something to drop down in this well, I can give you this water, Jesus is saying to the woman. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. See, Jesus, she's starting to think in the sense of the, in the, her human nature, thinking about water to nourish the body, where Jesus is talking about living water eternal to nourish the soul. Jesus was saying, 
drink the water that I give you and you will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him, sorry, indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of living water. This is his ongoing nature, this spring that is ever flowing. It doesn't stop, it doesn't cease, welling up to eternal life. So here we are at this crossroads where Jesus is sharing this woman that if you have this water, you're still going to be thirsty. If you realise who I am, the Messiah, and if you give your life to me, you will never be thirsty again. You'll never want for anything again. Your soul will be satisfied. What can we relate that to in our world today? There's so many things in our world that we we yearn for, we look for, we desire, and in some ways they're, they're, they're fair and reasonable things to ask for. But you know what? They won't last. You know, whether it's relationships, whether it's health, whether it's um, a career, whether it's security in whatever ways you see security, all these things we try to prop up for ourselves, they're all fair and they're all reasonable in our current culture and society, but they won't last. Maybe you don't know Jesus is your Lord and Saviour and maybe today you need to realise that Jesus is saying, recognise who I am and you won't be thirsty in your soul ever again. Nothing in this world can, can, can sustain like I can, can give you peace like I can. All these things that you grab for or try to build up, they'll all rust, they'll all wear out, they all decay but a right relationship with Jesus Christ and recognising that he's the Messiah, the Son of God, will not decay. It will last forever. It will be a spring welling up for eternal life. So Jesus starts his conversation with this girl and that was really moving through some serious boundaries. Jesus offered in verse 10, new life, living water, salvation, Jesus desired her to know who he really is and that's the son of God. And he's here to save the world and he's here to save her. Oh, this, this conversation, this account, you know, it's probably one of the longest, if not the longest account one-on-one that Jesus has with someone in the New Testament. It's incredible. But yet in her, in her humanity, let's look at verse 15 because we can already see that she's struggling. Remember at the end of verse First, um, was it 12? She was very practical and when Jesus was saying about giving her living water, she's saying, well, how, how are you going to get that living water, Jesus? Well, let's look at verse 15. Just after Jesus talks about those that drink this water, this eternal water, this spring of water welling up to eternal life, if you have this, you will not thirst. And verse 15 says, the woman said to him, so give me this water so I can, I won't be thirsty again and I don't have to keep coming to draw the water. It's like, well, hang on. She still hasn't got it. But it's, let's not be, let's not look down on this lady because she just hasn't got it. Because I think even for, even for the potential new believer or even for the potential believer that's walked down the path for many years, we quite often can think of our God, our Lord Jesus, as um, you know, just a, a, a practical crutch to hang on. Quite often we think, well, hang on, if I give my life to Jesus, everything in my life will now become easier. This woman thought about this, this miracle that may occur by this man, and, well, she didn't think about her soul. She thought about the practical part where she thought, I don't have to come down here every day anymore. That'll be easier. Jesus wasn't talking about that. Jesus isn't talking about making aspects of our life easier. In fact, as a follower of God, sometimes I wonder if it's even harder in this world. But we have a hope of eternal life and the Holy Spirit to encourage us. So this woman misinterpreted Jesus and, and saw only really the potential miracle or the relationship with Jesus that just might make her life easier. But Jesus wasn't wanting just to do that, so she struggled with that. And in verse 17 as well, let's look at verse 17. Jesus, actually, go back to verse 16. Jesus then told her, go back and call your husband 
I have no husband, she replied. See, Jesus is just about to speak into the sin in her life. She said she has no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. So she was being honest. The fact is you have five husbands and the man that you are now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. She's starting to recognise that Jesus could look into her life in a way that no one else could. This man that she'd never met before was totally aware of the sin in her life. Totally aware of the sin in her life. So the beautiful part about the first section of this passage, this conversation that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman, that he steps over the boundaries of culture to ensure that someone gets to know who he is. Jesus offers new life, salvation to this woman. Jesus really desires for her to know who he really is. It takes her some time. Jesus implies whatever is good in this world and what the world may offer, you know what, it's not going to last. You need this living water. You need to have your soul corrected by salvation. Put Jesus first in your life if you want a life of peace and a life of hope. In this, the woman still struggled by understanding that, hang on, this maybe this relationship can benefit me practically. It's like, that's not really the reason. That's not the core reason. And Jesus spoke into her life about sin and the recognition that repentance needs to occur. This conversation could be exchanged for really any of us today, could, not, could it? The components that I just spoke about help us appreciate Jesus' desire to provide this woman living water salvation and it's still the same today. This message is exactly the same 2,000 years later. These aspects are key aspects to the gospel, to eternal salvation. Maybe you don't know Jesus today. Maybe you've been seeking out Jesus in some way, shape or form. Maybe you think being a Christian might be good because I have got some practical difficulties and Maybe Jesus can just help with those. You know he will, but he really wants your heart. It's not just to help you practically. He wants to press reset on your soul. Have you made a decision for Jesus, the bread of life, the living water who always provides, always sustains, with the added gift of eternal life one day with him? Jesus declared to her in verse 10. Turn back to verse 10. If you, know, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked for the drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. In other words, her life or our lives can be completely fulfilled with this spring of living water through the course of salvation. Turn with me to John chapter 7. So that first section of John 4 with Jesus' encounter with the woman, the first steps of some gospel conversation to know who Jesus is. And I, I challenge both the non-believer, if you're, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, I challenge you to consider him, this living water, the bread of life. He will make your life complete. He will fulfil your soul. And I also talk in that same light for that passage for those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. There's some really good points there about how, how does the gospel, um, how does it bear fruit in our lives? When's the last time you spoke to someone about Jesus? When's the last time that you sat with someone and that you really don't feel comfortable with Have you stood outside the areas of your comfort zone to talk to someone about Jesus? So in chapter 7 now, I want to look at the living water, the spirit. In chapter 7, verse 37, it's quite short. 
Jesus is at, a, at this meal, a great feast actually. And it says in verse 37, on the last day, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, has streams of living water will flow from within him. Verse 39, this is meant, by this he meant the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. But for for today, those of us who know Jesus as our Lord and Saviour are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. We have this living water, the spirit, and this source of living water is a spring that is continually flowing. What is the fruit of that in our lives, I ask you today? If you know Jesus is your Lord and Saviour, what is the fruit of that? For those of you who don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, maybe you're thinking and contemplating about whether you should be putting Christ first in your life. This is how we cope with life. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not just going to be about you going forward. We have the Holy Spirit, this incredible source, ongoing source of living water from within. And um, it's going to be a continual flow. But this Holy Spirit, this business around the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's work in my life, has always perplexed me a little bit. Because I'm sure the day that we give our life to Christ, no one has any more Holy Spirit given to them than anyone else. So why is it that some people go on for Christ in an amazing way and maybe some just stumble along for 10, 20, 30 years. Let's have a little bit of a think about that. Note salvation, I wanted to connect though, salvation and the spirit can't be separated, they go together. This sense of living water and the references to it about being sustainable and forever present in your life, in the life of a believer. And this indicates to me, our dependence on the Holy Spirit. Our dependence on the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to recognise that the Holy Spirit as a Christian is a a huge central part of our life and it's paramount. But who do you... What what aspects of your, your life do you support the most? In verse 38, it said, Living water shall flow from him. If you want the spirit to grow in your life, we need to see a reduction to ourselves and a reduction of sin. So how can we do this? What's a simple way that we can do this to enable this living water, the Holy Spirit, to be forever a spring in our life? There's probably many different ways and it goes beyond just today's, today's um, sermon. But um, I recognised as we walked in there this morning, Acts 2.42... Um, It's easy because I know it, but maybe you don't, so maybe we need to turn to it. Turn your Bibles to Acts 2.42. You think I could find Acts quicker than that, couldn't you? So early church stuff here. So we've looked at this living water salvation which Jesus desires the woman of the world to recognise who he is, the Son of God. We've slightly touched on the work of the Spirit in our life is a part of this well, this spring of living water. How do I ensure I don't cap the well, cap the spring? Because you can cap a spring. It says in verse 42, this is one of many ways that we can build up the work of the Spirit in our lives. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. These are really simple things, you know. But if you start deleting any of these things out of your life, if you're a believer, I guarantee that you're starting to put a cap on that Holy Spirit spring in your life. You're starting to quench the work of the Holy Spirit because, in other words, you're not working on things that are obviously putting God first in your life. You're just working on things that prop up your own life and your own hope and your own security. If you want the Holy Spirit to work powerfully in your life, to give you a peace that passes all understanding, 
be in God's word, be in good fellowship, have the breaking of bread to remember what Jesus has done and be in prayer. Start stripping any of these things away. It's going to be trouble in your life as a believer. And for the non-believer today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, maybe today is the point where you want to stop and contemplate to recognise who Jesus is. He's the Son of God. And these things, these aspects in our life, being devoted to teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread in prayer, support the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. I say it again, you start stripping these out and filling them with other things, you'll start to put a cap on that spring, that well of the Holy Spirit in your innermost being. I want to draw our attention also to today, because we're about to take communion, um, to what Jesus has done on the cross. But ultimately, too, today, I want us to recognise who Jesus is, this living water. He sustains us. Nothing else in this world will fill us like a right relationship with Christ. The work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is powerful and it sustains us as well. It bears fruit of the gospel. There's a couple of things that we need to do to ensure that our walk with God is still putting him first. Our walk with Jesus is still putting him first to enable the Holy Spirit to work powerfully in our lives. See, the giving of our lives to Jesus or our fixing our eyes on this living water is so much more than the work of one brief moment. It's not just the brief moment of giving your life to Christ, whether it's here today or whether it was 15 years ago. It's more than that. When Paul said in Galatians 2 verse 20, I live by faith in the Son of God, he was speaking about a lifestyle rather than just a fleeting thought or a brief prayer. If you want to walk by faith, it's a lifestyle. It's not just a brief thought now and again that I realise that there is a Jesus. It's more than that. It's an ongoing ongoing relationship with Christ and putting him first in your life. We must do more than just cast our eye in Jesus' direction. We must be in communion with him and constant fellowship with him if we want to grow and realise this spring of living water in our lives. And I want to close with the fact that I want you to remember that we cannot fellowship with Christ too closely, nor can we expend too much energy in the direction of pursuing a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Because we normally, we do a lot of, push a lot of energy into other areas of our lives. But we can't exert too much energy in pursuing a right relationship with Christ. If we make drawing closer to Jesus our aim in life, we'll find ourselves starting to further appreciate Jesus' words when he says back in John 14, and turn with me, verse 13 John 4 and verse 13 it's probably a key verse today Jesus answered everyone who drinks this water that's the water in the well will become thirsty again so in other words anything in this world that you dip down into and get your sustenance from it might be fine but it's going to run out and then you'll have to look for another well and it'll run out And then you'll have to look for another well. And you can see that in society today, people moving from thing to thing to thing to thing to have satisfaction. Jesus knew this 2,000 years ago. It's no different today. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. This is a right relationship with Jesus. If you don't know Jesus today and you want to stop thirsting in your soul for things or you have emptiness, fill it with the living water of Jesus Christ today, I pray. Indeed, the water I give him will become a spring. A spring, not just a certain amount that might run out, a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. Mm. After the service, if you don't know Jesus and you're, you're feeling like this woman, you're feeling like Jesus or the Holy Spirit is having this conversation with you today, 
don't end the conversation. Finish it by talking about Jesus to someone here who you may know or come and see myself. Don't let today go without giving your life to Christ, the eternal spring of living water. Let's pray. Just as we pray, we're going to give thanks for communion and start to the worship team to, to come up and lead us into that. Just as we close our eyes and pray, just want to reiterate those thoughts that we cannot fellowship with Christ too closely nor can we exert too much energy in pursuing a right relationship with Jesus. If we make drawing closer to Jesus our aim, we find ourselves starting to further appreciate Jesus, his love for us, and the continuance of this living water. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to share in communion this morning. We thank you for the joy of being in worship together and fellowship together. Um, Lord, for those that don't know you, Today, Lord, I pray that they recognise that you are the Son of God, Lord Jesus, that you love them and you desire to quench the thirst of their souls this morning. Lord, for those of us who know you and that have been journeying with you for some time, Lord, wait, may we recognise that the work of the Holy Spirit in our life, the outpouring of that, Lord, Lord, we just thank you that um, we have this ongoing spring within us that is your Spirit. Lord, for those of us, um, I pray for the gospel work in our lives, that we too can be a testimony as Jesus was testifying to who he is. Lord, may we testify in areas that we don't feel comfortable to who Jesus is, Lord. Help us point people to Christ, I pray. Lord, just thank you for the work of the cross today. In Jesus' name, amen.